Bobby is in Steinberg. You know what the fuck it is. Aries and Andy, you and the jerk. You know what's time to get this work. The real raw, gutter, uncut cocaine. No political corrections. Always sleep. Fuck being a woke. We discuss politics and jokes. Cry, we lick. There's levels to this shit. Before you were sucking on your mama's tit. Airy Spears don't give a fuck. We talk about race a lot. Racism. Sexism. Much love to my loyal bitch bag holders. Rollers, clip loaders. We got them in the folders. The whole world on our shoulders. Spears and Steinberg. So yeah. normally, uh, people, we would have, uh, I would be singing reunited and it feels so good uh but then andy uh and i had a date we was where were we supposed to be somewhere in missouri blue room missouri blue room comedy club in missouri yeah and then that got uh canceled because the owner was a douche uh so then we ended up having a second week off uh after we were already a week off from uh kansas city yeah. Andy and I. Yeah, and I, uh, I was out here with my with my mom and my sister came out to see me in uh, in New York in New Jersey, and they were t- I was going to take that Kansas City week off, thinking I was only one week. We were going to be one week apart. Right, and it, and it ended up being two. Yeah, because uh, of some fuckery. Didn't you Didn't you say your mother and and your sister y'all went to go see a Broadway show? Yeah, we went and saw Beetlejuice. Hmm. How was that? Uh, it was, you know, it was fun. Uh, I, I've never really been to a Broadway musical before. Uh-huh. So uh, it was interesting. I liked it. I, I liked it. Um, it was interesting. You know, I would like to see some other music. I have nothing to compare it to. So I guess I, I don't know any other way to say it. But, was, it uh, uh, was it sweet? It was fun. It was nice. It was, uh, it was a very comfortable musical to go with your family. It was all lighthearted. There was nothing... Uh, any, uh, it, you know, it's it's Beetlejuice. Uh, the depth wasn't deep, you know. <clears throat> so uh, it, it was interesting. I like how what they did with it. I mean, they rewrote it for a stage, and it, it worked. It worked. But uh, I have a fondness for the original Beetlejuice, and uh, oh, the original was great. Michael Keaton, yeah, and I, yeah, I love that the- Beetlejuice. Yeah. yeah. So, and Tim Burton was the director, and it was a great uh, film. So. Uh, does it compare? I like the film better than I like the musical, but I thought they did a great job with the musical and just how they do the musical and the the set changes. Yeah, it was. It's worth. Se- it's definitely worth seeing. It, they did a great job. Uh, I want to go see more Broadway shows. I'm not a Broadway show aficionado, and I'd like to get out and see some more shows so that I have more to compare it to. But I'm, that was my first musical, live musical that I ever been to. So I have nothing. How long? To how, how, how long? How long is a musical? Uh, I thought I thought it was like an hour and a half. It's like going to a movie. Really? That's it? Yeah, I think it was like forty five minutes to an hour for the first. Uh, there's two two parts, I guess. I, there's I'm sure there's real words for what I'm supposed to be saying. Intermission. Yeah, the, but, you know, there's an intermission. So I think it's like forty five minutes intermission and then another forty five minutes. Really? I thought Broadway. I thought they those things run like at least two to three hours. No, it might have been a little longer. It might have been, you know an hour for the first one. I think the first, second one was only 45 minutes though. Wow. But right. I had a, gr- I had a good time. My sister and I, uh, we, 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 we don't always communicate the best. So there's always some issues, but, uh, got along pretty well this trip. My mom had a good time. Uh, the, and then we, you know, we went to the city a lot. I took her, I, I took him to Chinatown we, and I had some of the best I went, uh, I've never been, and I don't know. I should never ask you this. Have you ever been to a Yankees game? At the no, I've never been to. I've never only pro games I've ever been to. Pro events is boxing and basketball. I've been to b- baseball games you know, and quite a few all over uh, over the country, uh, different spots. But I've never been to a Yankees game in Yankee Stadium, and I never went to the o- old Yankee Stadium. I've seen the Yankees play, but never in their stadium. And uh, this is my first time. My sister got bleacher seats. We saw the Red Sox on Saturday night when they beat up the Red Sox. Good. The fucking Red Sox kid. Yeah. Fucking uh, bastard. The fucking diver. I, I posted some uh, some uh, clips of Bobby Patterson uh, getting booed by the stands. Uh, the you be- know, I, that never fucking bothers me, kid. Those fucking New Yorkers, they got no fucking manners. <laughs> they yell at you. They spit at you. They throw fucking feces on you. They're like fucking monkeys in a cage. And then there's the black people. 
<laughs> but seriously, one of the best times I, I, I've had at a sporting event. They were so much fun. The bleachers were fun. It, it, it started to sprinkle at one point where we thought it was really going to rain, and it didn't. It just, it just, just enough to cool us off. Who won? The Yankees beat them good, too. Uh, and, and yeah, they fucking trashed this kid. They fucking, it was wicked how bad they beat us. We all, but, we might as well have been a fucking team full of slaves. They beat us so fucking bad. Name's Bobby Patterson, by the way. They, uh, the uh, Red Sox came back the night before, got him in a tie, and then won the game, which was disappointing to everybody. So this game, they really, the uh, uh, Yanks came at him hard. I got the, I got a retro, I got, I don't know if you can see it, but I got a retro hat. Uh, it's my first fitted, man. I figured I was in Yankee Stadium. I'm going to get a fitted, and uh, I'll always get the snapback. And uh, mm. I like the snap. I don't know how you dudes wear these fitteds all wool in the summertime when you can have a nice snapback uh, trucker with the open air, the ventilation. You just said it, trucker, nigga. We don't, we don't fuck with nothing. It's trucker like nigga. <laughs> niggas with CB radios, the radio they part is. Yeah, uh, Blind Wolf, this is uh, Boar's Head. Yeah, we just drove past the High 55 freeway. Uh, a lot of trees, a lot of bushes. Looks like a forest inside. Uh, saw a couple of niggas hanging from trees uh, on the I 55. So uh, check it out. This is uh, Boar's Head. Ouch. Yeah, man, I, I need I need the trucker hat during the summertime. This is uh, it's too hot, but I wore it for the pod. Not that anybody can see it. I'll, I'll probably wear it next week when we're videoed. But uh, yeah, I like I like I, I like that I got the old school logo. Because we got so many fucking Dominicans and Puerto Ricans and Hispanic and the fucking locker room. It smells like fucking adobo, kid. It smells like fucking adobo, adobo and fucking plantains. Uh. After the, there were some uh, street vendors after the the game. Were there? Yeah. So there was there was a there was a slight hint of adobo out there, but not really. Uh, mm. But we we ended up we ended up uh, taking the subway back home because my I took a we got a car service to p- take us out there because my mom's knees bad. I didn't want to. I, I wanted her not to walk that much before she got there, and so we got there, and then she really wanted to take the subway, so we we jumped on the subway and we had a great time. It, 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 my mom got to. Uh, very interesting. I, I did see uh, two uh, trans women that were on the train. Uh, oh, uh, it was speaking was, of uh, which. Yeah. <laughs> Go ahead. No, that's going to segue. No, no, I'm not going to get into it now, but that can segue into one of the little appetizers before we give the audience the main meal. M- main meal today. Yeah. And it uh, 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 and very well done. Uh, very well done. Uh, other than the, the large frame. Uh, yeah, and it, just this one guy, it was just very funny because one dude figured it out as he was looking at him. And he, you know, you could see like the lights going off and it, he was thinking about it. And then all of a sudden it hit him and he was like, damn, oh, mm. I get it. And he started walking up and down the train and he goes, mm. I, I, oh, my God. And he's just laughing. And I was like, OK. But uh, you know, my mom got the New York experience. She wanted some subway. I was gonna ask. I was gonna ask. Did she get the New York experience? I was like, damn. Between the Yankees, some uh, some street vendor food, the subway, throwing a couple of trans and a rape. Yeah, it's the New York experience. Yeah, I took her to Chinatown. I really gave her the New York New York experience. Uh, so Chinatown, uh, a little dim sum, and then what else did we do? I'm trying to remember if we did anything else amazing. Uh, we went to uh, oh, I did take her to the nine uh, eleven memorial, and they, uh, uh, you know, I don't know, I, I don't know how you say you liked it, but she was she she uh, she saw it, she was impressed by uh, how they redid it. Uh, we had a good time. My mom had a good week out here. They stayed in an Airbnb in Hoboken, so uh, during the day they got to go. If they were on their own, they got to go eat at some of uh, uh, Hoboken's finest, and they had a good time. Um. I downloaded and watched um, Jurassic Park Dominion. Yeah. Uh, I liked it, man. I liked it. I liked it. I liked it. That It really, you know, that really brings out the kid in me, man. Uh, you know, I, I never was a real big dinosaur lover as a kid, but I'm fascinated to, at the idea that 60 something odd million years ago, these fucking things were walking around. But I got to say, man, it was good to see they brought the all the whole gang back for this one, which seems I, which it seems like since the Avengers, that's a thing now is in movies to bring the old the whole band back together. Uh, and I got to say, you know, 
one of my favorite characters from the the very first one was um uh 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 Jeff yeah yeah Jeff Goldblum as <laughs> Ian Malcolm. But I got to say, man, I got to say this. And, you know, I, you just did it. And I don't do a good Jeff Goldblum, but that's, you know, uh, 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 Jeff, uh, uh, the, the, you know, that uh, the stutter. And I got to say, man, in this one, it seems like, and, and Jeff Goldblum from his commercials to things I've seen on social media, just seems like a very over-the-top, cool motherfucker. Um, but he also seems like as he's getting older, especially in in this Jurassic movie, when he delivers his lines, he's part of the the New York City drag queen scene. Like, he's got that Tracy Morgan. Hi. Mm -hmm. How are you? Uh How are the kids? Oh, my God. It's it's really exaggerated now. It's exaggerated, but I honestly think... I, and you know I love Jeff Goldblum. I have nothing but love for Jeff Goldblum. I love movies that people haven't even... A lot of movies are out that I've seen that I don't think a lot of people have seen. Uh, he has a show that's on uh, Prime, uh, a series that he did. I watched most of them. Just an entertaining guy to me. A very unique kind of character. That's a good way to put him. He's a unique character. I felt he cashed a check on this one. I don't feel like... I really felt like his, <laughs> he was, his character was the same... There wasn't that passion for that part. I didn't see it in him. I could be wrong. I think they all did. I, I think this was one big, huge yeah. last hurrah of a payday. Ching! And that was it. Yeah. yeah. But uh, the special effects, like I said to you, if there was an award for the lo- loudest movie ever, this is probably one of the awards. Hey, man. Uh, listen, of course, the T-Rex has always been the main star in the dinosaur world and in these movies. But I don't know what you call that dinosaur, but I was psyched as fuck to see the new one they added with the long fingernails. Yeah. yeah. That was fucking... That that scene where she's crawling on her belly and gets in the water and it's behind her and then they show the screen, half her in the water, half it above her. Yo, that shit was intense. It was. I, there was parts of the movie that I liked, but I, honestly, uh, I saw it in the theater and it's definitely a download movie. You, you, you know, I I would have loved to have seen that in the theater. Well, you do get all the sound and you get the bigger picture. But I, I don't know that I like spending $20 on that one. You're such a fucking you. I, I would love to spend it on other movies, just not that one. Why not that one? It was a great movie. Come on. Uh, yeah, but I, I did I, I did like it. My, uh, my kids liked it. it. It was good. It just wasn't. You know, I, I don't think that you can... You know, how many times can you, like, surprise you with dinosaurs? We so, Once we went past the first one, I mean, they're all good, but I'm not surprised anymore. I know what the movie's going to be. I know what it's right. going to be about. So, yeah, I just, yeah. this has to be the last one because really the only way you could, the only place you could take it from here is in space. And that's truly jumping the shark. Uh, they could come close. They're almost there. <laughs> it gets <laughs> right, right. it gets on Elon Musk's uh, SpaceX by accident, and uh, they go and colonize Mars. Right, the dinosaurs, and then they get there. And, yeah, that, that there there's the new plot. This is a galaxy CSRS. <laughs> uh, um, okay, let's real quick. Let me go back because when you mentioned your mom and the the train and the, the trans. I don't know if you could say train, chair, tran. I don't know if all that goes together. Train to trance. Oh, I've got to get on the trance trade. Um, dude, you know, you saw the thing with Dave Chappelle, Minnesota. Uh, when they were throwing stuff? No, when they canceled his show, sold out show. Uh-uh, I didn't see that. You didn't see that? Uh-uh. I posted it. With Dave Chappelle? Yeah, or yeah Dave? He, had, he, had, he had a sold out show at a theater in Minnesota and at hours before the show was scheduled to start, the venue canceled it. And they wrote to the people of Minnesota or, you know, to obviously the group, we hear you. And then another venue picked it up uh, several miles away and and held the show. That way, those people didn't uh, feel like they, you know, spent their money. Well, they were going to get reimbursed anyway. But yeah. another venue picked it up. And of course, I, you know, I, I, I wrote a lot in my caption and uh, both Russell Peters and D.L. Hewley uh, liked it. And, you know, long story short, I just said, why stop it, Dave? Why not cancel movies now? 
and music and musicians or anything artistic that hurts your feelings. And uh, a lot of people were like, comics should never do that venue again. I said, I'll take it a step further than that. I think comics, and I also said in my caption, you know, when is somebody, when it, if you're a lover of art and free speech, when I, not just, I, I feel like comics, I'm not just mad at people, but I'm mad at comics. Because at what point do comics and the general population, who, again, who are fans and lovers of comedy and the arts, come together and say enough is enough? Who is going to be our Steve Rogers to yell Avengers assemble? Because this is clearly a war and an assault on, on, on free speech and the arts. And I think every comic should come together and go, we're, you tried to ban Dave, we're banning you. We're banning Minnesota. No comedians are to perform in Minnesota. What venue? Because that's it? insane. What venue was it? Do you know? I forget the name of the, 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 the theater. You know, um, that was this weekend then, right? Yeah. Yeah, see, uh, just to let you know, uh, Tara took uh, Friday and Saturday off from work. She wasn't going to do any work. So I didn't have, I haven't had my phone on. I haven't looked at social media. Uh, we have, uh, I've just hung out with Tara. We cooked, we hung out, we watched the movie, had nothing to do with it. So I had no idea. Yeah. I would like to know the name of this, uh, who, but the other theater in Minnesota picked it up though, right? It was in Minnesota. It was another venue somewhere in Minnesota that picked it up. So that's not fair to do to Minnesota, but we, we should not No comedian should do the room Especially, that's a sneak attack because you knew before two hours that you were going to cancel that show. Somebody hinted that maybe one of the top, you know, whoever power players involved in that show, maybe that was, they were gay or part of that community. And as you said, it was a sneak attack. So maybe they went, yeah, we're going to act like we're going to do this show, but at the last second, pull the plug to, you know. Because then uh, no one can pick it up. Right. And then show our power. Yeah, but then someone was smart enough to jump in both feet and get it get it done. So I wouldn't do that to Minnesota because Minnesota obviously came out and supported it, but I would do it to that venue. I would definitely yeah. do it to that venue. Yeah, I hear you. I just, I, you know, I just was so en enraged because I was just like, and everybody else in the comments were like, who the fuck cancels a sold out show? It's like, and then for you to put in your caption, we hear you. It's like, if you're listening and you hear anybody, the show was sold out. So to the people who are protesting and who are pissed off, fine, you have that right. But to go, we hear you. Well, then, so you hear them, but you don't hear the people that evidently bought tickets to sell it out? Well, you know, a lot of people, I remember, I, I remember this too when someone, uh, when Gerard, Gerard Carmichael said, uh, Dave Chappelle has picked a, a weird hill, hill to die on, right? Basically, or to you know, make a stand. Right. I, I don't think that that's true. I, I I heard what he said, but Dave Chappelle has so much more, and they're trying to make this one thing be his thing. Even when he comments on it, or when they say uh, specials that they that, uh, that people have come out against, it's a it's a portion of the show. It's not the whole show. Yes, there is shows that have that uh, where he's uh, responding to what's been said. But you hear you hear one thing that he said. How about all the other stuff that he said? How about all the other pro and positive stuff? How about the pro and positive stuff that's in his act that you're not hearing because you want to you want to reduce it to sentences? The overall of everything that he said is not what they're trying to portray this to be. So, uh, yeah, man, I I would you know not that anybody cares where I'm going to perform, but I would gladly say I'd never perform there. Let me ask you this. If 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 all the, the most, you know, big names in comedy, you know, Sebastian Maniscalco, Gaffigan, Whitney Cummings, Chappelle Burr, if they all said, yeah, let's do this gigantic protest and ban Minnesota, uh, every comedy club in Minnesota, if you're a local act in Minnesota, knowing that there's this strike and the club says, hey, you know, we can't be shut down. We'll pay you X amount of dollars to perform. And, you know, you're a local guy. You try to feed your family, pay the rent. Do you break the, the picket line? If you're not a name brand, I mean, if you're not a name brand, is it, it, it you're the, the, I would think that the, 
the protests would be, we're not sending out big names. You can come to the show. You can go see the local guys, but um, we're not going to bring, we're not going to let big names come because that's what hurts the community uh, is when they no longer can have what they desire. They're not desiring the local guy. They'll go see the local guy. But even for the hardcore comedy fans, when you say they don't desire the local guy, but if they're, you know, if they're, you know, local, uh, uh, you know, citizens of Minnesota and they enjoy comedy with a deep passion for comedy, you don't think, you know what I'm saying? You you, you don't think that they want to see the local guys? I don't think that the local guys, I don't think that the local guys continuing to perform breaks the the strike line. I really don't because that's not what I, I grew up in a city like like Tucson, Arizona. Let's say that that's where I grew up. But so let's not just say that that is where I grew up. Um, we lived and died for a name coming through. It was great that we had local comics or that we had local people that entertained us in a variety of music acts or whatever. But we lost our shit when someone. Are oh, you talking about as a as a as a someone who lives there? Yeah. Right. So if there's local guys, but you you're saying oh like smaller acts come through just to keep the place done? No, no, I'm I'm saying that if 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 the biggest name comics put the word out, hey, even to you local guys, this is about us. This is about our art form. Don't perform. Damn yeah, man, I don't know. I don't know. I got to feed my family. You you right. You're you, you have a, a you have a reason to stand on this, and I think you doing that sends the sends a message me feed not feeding my family sends a different message i'm going to feed my family I, right. I don't i don't think that people are going to like think that the 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 strike was ruined because i did it you know it's interesting there's a comic out there that i think is pretty funny his name's chad mcdaniels chad daniels not mcdaniels chad daniels well, i don't know where the oh because I, I i date a mick i live with a mick tara <laughs> tara's mccormick that's where this mick comes from oh <laughs> But uh, it, it's Chad Daniels. There it is. I, I'm always throwing mix on things now. Uh, he's funny, man. He's a funny comic, and he lives out there. I'd love to get his uh, his. I I want to know what his uh, impression of it was. We'll have to maybe we can call him up one day and see what he thinks about this. Um. Yeah, uh, and incidentally, um, I, I remember. I think our boy, keep your pimp hand strong, Dwayne Curse commented about that uh, Dave Chappelle thing where he spoke to his alma mater and I think he got confused and thought it was supposed to be stand up and talked about how boring it was uh, and it wasn't stand up it was Dave giving a speech to his alma mater of course with some little bit of tidbits of comedy sprinkled in I didn't think he uh, thought it was any, did he say it was boring? Yeah he said he was. He thought it was boring he was like damn I could go smoke a doobie in the bathroom but he, he and, and I explained to him I responded to the email and said, no, no, brother, that wasn't, he wasn't doing stand-up. That was a, a speech to his alma mater. He's you know? doing, he's doing storytelling is what he's doing. It's yeah. St- and it's, it, yeah. And, and I, I, I think there's a, it's a different, it, it, it's, it's not true stand-up. Storytelling was around long before stand-up was here. Yeah. No, I, I only brought that up to say, cause you had mentioned Gerard Carmichael, that thing he did at the end was, I thought was hilarious when he unveiled the name of the, the name, yeah. school, and he said maybe we should call it the Gerard Carmichael. He he he, he jokingly yeah. inserted Gerard in that. Yeah. So I just thought that was funny because he obviously took a jab at him for Gerard taking a jab at him. Yeah, I think that if people who don't understand uh, the art of storytelling and what storytelling is and how it is connected to co- comedy, it's still entertainment. Uh, and you and you're looking for Dave comedy, you're not going to get that, and you're going to be bored. But if you if you like the adventures of storytelling, where he gets to a point and he still delivers humorous, uh, uh, you know, uh, uh, barbs. Yeah, those are those are worth hearing. Let me tell you, not to beat a dead horse, but I was up last night from midnight uh, till about five this morning, and I watched a bunch of uh, stand up specials, and I watched the closer again. And speaking about storytelling. You know how I, I would say, yeah, there's different facets to stand up. And like I said, once upon a time ago, doing crowd work was something I was intimidated by. But I went, look, man, if you're going to be Jordan, you, every part, you got to have you no weaknesses in your game. So I tighten that part up. I think the next thing I want to really try to tackle is storytelling. Because when Dave tells a story, especially in the closer, because because of the gravity of what it is, 
the way he gets it, you could hear a mouse piss on cotton. Yeah. The dead silence as he takes his time, and it, especially with the serious parts of the story. And it's just eerily quiet. And you could feel where the audience is sucked in. He has got him exactly where he wants him. And then to deliver that punchline filled with intelligence. That's so beautiful. I get goosebumps. I want to I want to do that. I want to be able to do that. But I, I get that. And I think that storytelling is is awesome. And I think that I would like to say that I, I'm hybrid into storytelling where some of my stuff gets a little bit more story-ish. But uh, you surrender uh, the laughter for the silence. And that's really tough. I mean, that's really tough. Yeah, but the, that payoff, though. When, payoff when you, is great. When, right. When you get the laughter with mixed with that silence and that seriousness, that is, that's beautiful. But sometimes that's the beautiful. laughter isn't as big as a bi- a good punchline at the end of 10. Well, that depends on you. That, that, I think that, that falls on the storyteller. Well, it, it, it's also on the meaningfulness of the story. Like what you want to convey. The, the, right. joke, the joke or the, or the meaning. Speaking of which, now that bleeds me into my last thing. Uh, Damon Wayans, I forget, he was on some, doing some interview. And in regards to Dave, he said, are they, is it stand up or are they speeches? And it, and it, and and listen, I know that the respect Damon has for Dave is tremendous and vice versa. So I don't want to say it felt like he was taking a jab at Dave or more so I would interpret it. A ser- well, that's a serious question. That's a that's a is that a valid serious question? Is it preachy? Is it speeches? Well, if you are, if you're not, I I, I love the stories, and I love how he talked about his school and how he brought it all around. And it's you have to listen to the whole story. It comes full circle and it delivers you a whole message. But if you're if you come in again, if you're coming in for stand-up, traditional stand-up, you might feel like it's it's a speech. You might feel like it's a speech. But I think they, there's an art to storytelling. I think Dave is rediscovering it and sending it out because it's 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 a different form of the uh, of entertainment. And it's 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 a lost art. And I think it's hard in this day and age where we're watching reels and TikTok videos and you're getting this quick bites every 20 seconds, every 30 seconds. A minute right. is a long time in how we're structured right now. I think when you break it down that way and how we're ingesting all this kind of entertainment these days, what Dave is doing is completely out of the box and away from and going in the opposite direction that we are are, are, are giving our brain this new entertainment. I, I'm, this TikTok reels thing, I get caught up into it where like I can't give up because they've been pretty good. And so I'm looking for that good one. I'm looking for the way to get out. This is a whole different experience where you are locked in and listening to someone for a while on a story. I, I think there's an amazing connection to the storyteller when you get into it and you listen to it. I think that when you're fed, and I'm going to say that reels and these TikToks and and Frankly, even just stand up, if you're just doing, if you're getting those punchlines in quick, you're getting sugar. You're getting that sugar taste, the thing that you like. You know, it tastes good. There's, it comes in and, and, and it's refreshing and it's great. And then, you, you know, it makes your brain go, ah, that's what sugar does. Right. But, it, but if you have to listen, but I think what Dave's doing with storytelling, that's more like eating, a, eating something that's been, uh, you know, more chef driven. It's quick, you know, right. it's, it, there's an art form behind every piece of it and you have to eat it. You have to dissect it. You have to, uh, you have to taste it. I mean, it, it, it you ingest it in a different way. So I think, right. I think he's going in a different direction. I don't know how many people want to go in that different, in that direction or how many people will want to pay money to sit there and listen to four stories in an hour versus a funny stand up <clears throat> special. Well, you know, it, it kind of reminds me into what you just said, the sugar, the rush. And, and once you start getting people used to a certain tempo, a certain flavor, uh, a certain energy, that's what they want. And, and, and they don't even know that they want something different 
until you force them to want something different. It reminds me of that moment in the Ray Charles movie when he's when he's now got this new guy who eventually becomes his right hand man as opposed to Clifton Powell's character. And he's on stage and he's trying to do country, this this slow, melo- uh, slow melodic country song. And the audience is screaming out, boo, we want the hits. George on my mind, hit the road, Jack. What'd I say? And the dude had the house lights brought down. And then that changed the mood of the audience. And Ray was able to do his country song. So, yeah, I, I, I think that sometimes, you know, audiences get lazy too. Just like sometimes comics get lazy and, you know, don't necessarily do new material, but they do the hits. And the audience is fine and they love the hits. But, you know, you try to introduce them to something different, there's resistance until you force them to see the beauty in something different. Um, I, but yeah. I think the way that he's doing this, and, and like this was, like you said, this was uh, the naming of his alma mater, the uh, the uh, um, the theater at his alma mater, his high school alma mater, right? Right, Duke Ellington, whatever it was. Yeah, so this is a great way, you know, you put this out there, and a lot of people have said, is this comedy? Is this stamp? What is this? Well, what was it? How did you how did you interpret it? How did you ingest it? How did you feel about it? Was it an interesting story? Were you uh were you intrigued? Did you listen the whole time? Did it open up your mind to hear it in a different way? I, I think he's presenting it. If he if he just said this is Dave's new stand-up special and you weren't ready for this, I think he's slowly seeding the field so that you're ready for it. I don't think that he just said, okay, I'm just gonna go do storytelling now. I think that he seeded the field in a different way. And he's getting people aware of what he's up to. Listen, my favorite thing about one of the favorite things about that special, which has nothing to do with the stand up, is the intro, the, the, the beginning. When you see a dude going through crates of, you know, comedy albums. Yeah. And you just see his different covers. And it just, again, to me, it's like great artistry, great jazz, great music, great anything isn't just one thing. Not to say you can't be great. As one thing, but, you know, evolution, creative evolution, you know, you know, growth. It's that can't ever be a bad thing. No. And anytime you 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 make a turn, anytime you turn left, people aren't ready for it. And so it's going to take a while. I'm not saying this is what he's going to do. I'm not saying this is the new format that people should be looking at. I'm just saying We've always changed in comedy the way that we've maneuvered to this, and it's changed over the years. This is just a new place. Don't, don't forget, this is not different. Bill Cosby used to have uh, the story. The Noah's Ark was a 20-minute beat on Noah building the ark. I mean, we were at longer. Comedy used to have longer stories in them with more jokes. So we just, we, we, we've we been going in this direction with quicker, faster than we've uh, over the years, this is a new, this is just, we're just evolving in a different way. There's no reason not to pick this up and say, wait, what have we checked this out over here? Is there something to this? Why not take another look at it? And I'm glad someone like him is the one that's doing it because it was someone else. It may never get noticed. Told me to cut you off, man, but we have to take a break. It's nothing personal. It's just business. All right. Time for the main meal. I hope you guys like the appetizers. Uh, here's the main meal. Supreme team on Showtime. Uh, off the bat, what did you think? Uh, well, you I, recommended this. No, I think I told you about it. I told you about it, but other people have been recommending it to you too. I've seen no, some, no, but you were you were initially the yeah. first one. Uh, this is a you know, I like the honesty that's behind this. Uh, even though it's still coming from, uh, I, I think Prince was very honest through this, but I think that the honesty is there, but it's still coming from a place of reverence. Do you know what I mean? Right. Uh, I mean, Nas has reverence for the, I mean, when you did, when you're watching it, kudos uh, to Nas also for, for directing and producing this. Yeah. Uh, but when you're listening to, you know, LL and he's talking about it, everybody has, there's reverence to these guys that you have for these guys. Cause they ran the street, you know, you respected them. Uh, well, like you said, I, I don't listen. I don't know that you respected what they did, but you respected the the results in terms of because LL said it, money. They had money. They had cars. They had nice clothes. And when you coming from poverty 
in that situation, uh, that's what you look up to. Come on, B. It's seductive. Come on, B. Seductive, man. <laughs> um, you know, growing up, you know, <laughs> it's crazy, man. You know, coming up on the Ave in the, in the block, you know, Scott's had money, man. Mercedes, BMW, Lexuses, you know, fur with the minks, the rings and the diamonds, man. Respected it, B. But <laughs> it's crazy, man. You know, and, and 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 to be in there and part of that, and when you see LL first, see himself as the young LL, right? Uh, and and he said it. You know, I couldn't even get close to that stage. I just had to take my place in the crowd with everyone else. You know, try to. So they, just the fact that they were there and successful. I'm not trying to say respect for what they did. They were respected for what they accomplished. Uh, and, and that accomplishment allowed them to have these parties and that someone like an LL wanted to hit that stage. He wanted to get that stage. So right. there, there's a lot more to this than just what they did. Again, uh, it's how they affect the community sometimes. And it's a negative effect overall for the community. And I think, absolutely. And I think, though, and one of the things, and I'm going to I'm going to get to the end of this conversation, and then we can go through it. But the end of the conversation for me was, I've never heard anybody speak about what they've done, and then go, but it was bad for the Prince was the first one that I ever heard go. Nah, man, this wasn't. You know, I'm reflecting. I'm a. I'm in prison now for how many whatever many years he's been there. Yeah, it wasn't a good thing. The money was good. The, the power's good. All that's good. But was it good? And I've never heard anybody be honest about it. That was the first dude I ever heard be honest. Well, they were always honest about it after the fact. They Not never like honest that. About he was... He nah, was I, I feel like they're always honest about it because, you know, when you're in jail and you ain't got nothing but time to think. And look, they I, I believe they know it's foul while they're doing it. But at that point, it's about the excess, the 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 the, the, the survival the means, the money, the lifestyle, you well, know, it's, it's, you know, they say it in there. Well, they're not going to get it from me. That's, that's the mentality that you have to keep so that you can do this. If they're not going to get it from me, they're going to get it from someone else. So I might as well live this life because otherwise someone else is going to be living this life and they're still going to be in the same place. That's the mentality you have to have to be able to do this to your community. Okay. Now this is the part, because you know, this is something that's always fucked with me and I, and I and I almost smacked myself because I went how have you never asked Andy this question so now I'm going to need you to put on two hats your Jew hat aka your money hat and your Grand Theft Auto Andy hat because this is some shit that's always plagued me when you hear about and these drug dealers go man I had this many homes this many cars and this is where I go listen man I'm a little bit of both worlds but more I'm more Huxtable than the Evans family. I, I I didn't grow up project poor, boom, 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 gunshots in the night poor, uh, but I didn't grow up brownstone and, you know, wherever the Huxtables were from, Brooklyn, well-to-do either. I was a little bit of both, but more Huxtable than good times. So I my street knowledge doesn't, can't answer this. How are these guys able to buy these homes and these cars with obviously drug dealer money. And I'm assuming their name ain't on no paperwork because that's a trail and proof. Is it in their name? If they're buying flat out cash, if and you're buying 50, 60, 70, $80,000 cars. And I guess back in the eighties, I don't know how much a luxury car was or a, a, an expensive car was back then, but even let's say it's 50 grand. 50 grand or up. Are you able to walk into a dealership and go, yo, here's 50 G's cash and there's no red flags? How are they doing this? Can I, I can I answer in a couple parts? That's why I said both hats. Okay. Um, first of all, I, I'm going to speak to the people themselves. Anyone who gets to that level, and I, and I can prove it too, and I'm not trying to put anyone down when I say what I'm about to say. Jay-Z, we know, was a street hustler, right? Yes. He's also a billionaire, right? Yes. Anyone who can raise to the level of a, uh, of a, of, to run a crew the way that 
you can run a crew the way that they ran crews, right? You already have a billionaire brain. You already have that mentality. You're smart. You know how to, you know how to, how to work every aspect of business before you got this far. You knew it, whether it was innate, whether you were just smart and whether you read, whether you talked to people, whether you understood it. There's a reason why certain people are billionaires. There's a reason why when you talk to people, ex-street hustlers, ex-gangsters who rose to a certain level and you talk to them, and this is where the, the, the downside is, hey, all these people could make it if they were given an opportunity outside of that opportunity. That's why they took that opportunity because that's all they saw to get out of that situation. And they built that business because they were smart. These mother, Most people aren't smart. Most people can't buy that shit. Most people are going to go to jail. Most people, and not that they, not all will end up in jail eventually because the, the, the genius part, the GTA part of this that you're talking about is you can make a thousand of the right moves. You can make a hundred thousand of the right moves doing illegal shit. You only have to make one wrong move for them to get you. So they're able to buy homes and cars if you legally know what, with illegal money and if, not. If you know how what you're doing and you know how to clean it up. Yes, cars are easy. Cars, fuck that. Cars are easy. I can go to a, you can go to a dealer and you can say, listen, the dealer's in business to make, to sell cars, right? So he can figure out how to get you a car. So if you go in there and go, yo, this Lamborghini in the 80s, right? And again, I don't know what the price was, but let's just say back then, here's 100 G's cash. They don't, they're not obligated legally to go 100 G's cash. Who does that? Red flag. Uh Uh-oh, we got to make a phone call. You got to know somebody inside to get your car. But you can get your car because now I can just, well, I can do a lease I can I can I can lease it to I I can move paperwork. But doesn't that around. require paperwork with, with, with your name and everything signature? that you do requires paperwork. But if you have someone that can help you with your paperwork, you can get a car. A car is not a problem. Once you get into homes and businesses, that's the problem. Anything cash on the street, cash coats, uh, a, a coat can be as much as a car. So yeah, you have to know how to spend your money. You have to know who to spend your money with. But you can get the, that part's easy. It's when you start getting to homes and businesses that you're that it's a different dollar range. Uh, if there are any drug dealers or hustlers or gangsters that listen to this podcast, please feel free to write in and let me know how you legally but illegally uh, do what you do. There's trust that you can use. There's offshore accounts, but you got to get your money to them. There's all different kinds of ways. But every time you go up a level, there's a new strategy to make money. But listen, every strategy, when you, when you listen to people who are, have money and how they pay their taxes, and then you hear that they're, they don't really spend, they don't pay taxes, that's the same idea of what you're talking about right now. How do we get to the, these levels and, and ma- maintain our money? There's no difference between, oh, I, I want to be careful how I say this. There's no difference between someone who has a gangster mentality that can run the street and has the business mind between someone who has is a billionaire. They still have a gangster mentality. They still billionaire. The billionaire still does. That's how they keep their money. That's how they reinvest their money. That's how they make their money. That's how they keep all their money. That's why you hear about companies that have that, that the government wants them to bring back their money to the United States because they've sold it all over the world. Yes. It's still a gangster mentality. Mm. I said while watching this, I said, boy, if selling drugs was legal, every nigga in America would be rich. And I shouldn't say that like that as though somehow blacks or Latinos have a uh well, I got it. This is where see, this is where I go. I'm not a huxtable. Because if I was, I'd have the education to have the word that I'm looking for. It's not knack. It's it, it I could say knack. But it's not knack. I'm looking for something a little bit more uh, sophisticated than that. But it ain't like blacks and Hispanics have a knack for wanting to sell drugs. Uh, but because certainly if it were legal, um, the white man would 
play just as intri- much as an integral part in doing so. And even that, I have to watch what I say because niggas and Hispanics ain't the one flying the shits in. So they are playing a role. But it, it, I'm just it, saying That's not 100% streets, true. That's not 100% true. What's not 100% true? It's not 100% true. When you say that, uh, you got to go... You got to go to Mexico and you got to see the tunnels that were built to bring in drugs underneath. There, there's tunnels that are in homes in Mexico that pop up in homes in other cities in Arizona. Who's behind that? <laughs> the cartels. Okay. They ain't white dudes. Okay, but aren't the cartels at some point dealing with someone on this side? Yeah, the sophistication of the illegal business is amazing. That's why if these people were put into any other business, they would be successful. That's what I'm trying to say. You, When you look at it the, from a street level and what you're saying is these are the opportunities. And that's why you, you relate it. You were relating it that blacks and Latinos have a knack. Like you said, knack is what they're around, their ability it, it, it's where their opportunity comes. It's like it's like sports. Why why do certain people gravitate to certain sports versus other sports? It's because of the opportunity. Uh, you you know, as we're seeing this right now, you see a lot of these uh, like like okay, let's let's take the NBA. So basketball is a, we would say it's a black sport, right? There's more black people playing basketball in the NBA level. Would you say yes. that? Yes. Where are all these white dudes coming from? That are coming from Europe. Poverty-stricken companies, this is their way out. It's, it's, it's about your opportunity, not necessarily just... I agree with that. I've always said that. I've always yeah. said that. So this is what it is. The opportunity from a street level, I mean, how, do I, how can I become the CEO of Citibank or I can become the CEO of, uh, 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 of, uh, uh, of 3.5 grams? <laughs> Hold that thought. Just on a side note, because uh, I saw something very interesting. I didn't know when, when, you know, yes, blacks dominate basketball, but it was a white guy that invented it. I didn't know till I saw the post about Dick Gregory. Slaves invented hockey. Yeah. Blacks invented hockey. I did not. I did not know that. Uh, That's my Johnny Carson moment. Hockey, but it also comes from uh, Native Americans as well. But yes, what Dick Gregory is saying is true. There's a lot of history with black slaves, uh, runaway black slaves, by the way. Uh, so these guys not only were able to get away, they actually built their own sport. Uh, but <laughs> then, but it also, the, uh, the indigenous American population had a similar game as well. So all these things are picked up. All right. Uh, back to what you were saying. Yeah. So no, this is a, it's an opera. This is a place where you can start your own business. And if you get lucky and you don't get busted and you can, uh, you can get seed money to, to start a bigger business that you can get out of this. But most people don't get out. Because as LL said, it's seductive, man. Come on, B. It's seductive. S- seductive, B. You know what I mean? It's like it's like a woman in a dress, man. With nice heels, man. Seduce you, man. <laughs> it's crazy, man. Um, dude, it seemed like between the two dudes, Supreme, what was the other one's name? Griff? Was it Griff? It was uh Prince and and they called him Prince. Uh, yeah, Prince and, but, and, and Prima. Supreme. Supreme. Pre, what am I getting Pre, Griff? Was Pre. somebody? No, there was Somebody probably I, I, there was some other guys on the side. So I, th- I, I thought know. Supreme, okay, the one that was the killer. The, 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 when Fifty Cent said, "Such and such is the businessman." And Prince Griff was is the, the killer. Yeah, Prince is the killer. They, I think was, Griff though. They called him Griff. Okay. Anyway, uh, the 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 one that was more not the killer, Supreme. I think Supreme. They called him Pre. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, he said he had the perfect childhood. Great came from a great family. Mom and dad was there. Why the fuck are you selling drugs? If you come from a great family, most, if not all, but damn, it seemed like most drug dealers are niggas that come from broken home, fucked up situation. You got to be the man of the house at 13 years old. The mom's fucked up. The dad's not there. If you come from a good home, why are you selling drugs? It's your opportunity to get out. I don't know what his, I don't know what his life was like. I, they didn't really, they said he came free. He said he came from a good home, but he didn't say like he, he wasn't going to go move up. Was he moving up? Was he going to go to some other place? 
Right. I, I, I'll tell you from my own experience, I just didn't want to be doing the same fucking thing that my family was doing. I didn't want to stay where I was. I wanted to get out of that. Plus, I wasn't looking for that to happen. It kind of happened because uh, it just fell into my lap. And maybe that's for him. It kind of just fell in and it's easy. And like again, it's seductive. And now all of a sudden, I, I'm going to tell you, um, if, if you're... Uh, I'm not, I wasn't the most outgoing person. I'm, I'm, I was very quiet. I was insecure. And now suddenly you're doing something that makes you money. And the girls, <laughs> I mean, that's, it's the, I, I'm telling you, it, when you talk about seductive, when you go from, I can't get any to like, I have to say no, it's a, it's, it, it changes your life in a, in a complete, not just in a monetary way. Right. Um, I always find it ironic that, and in, in this, uh, one of them said, the police would often describe coming into the black community as a jungle, but yet they're the wildest animals within the community. Again, that's that, that's that, that's that hypocritical contradiction. You know, we talk about racist, dirty cops that don't give a fuck about the black community don't have a relationship or a rapport with the black community. And they, they refer to the community as a jungle and they talk, they call us animals when they do the most animal like shit that could be done. Okay. But let's, let's address this all the way then. So, because this is, this is a, it's a tipping point for the story. First of all, because you just brought the police into it. Um, the police would have never done anything because and and when they say look at it as a jungle, as long as they stayed on whatever their block was, and that shit wasn't coming outside outside of that block, and they were they were uh, selling to each other, they were killing each other. There were the, the problems were in that area. That's what they called it. They called it the jungle, and as long as it stayed there, they weren't going to do anything about it. The only reason it changed. Because a white cop got killed. That's right. That's the that's the cha- that's the tipping point for crack in the nineties. But when you when you when you before you responded to this and you said, "But the I know you're not, but the but makes it seem like you're no. validating it." No, no, no. The but is this is what they see. This is what they built. They built it because they didn't go in there to try to change anything. They didn't go in there to try to improve it. They just looked at it as that's the, they built it. They not only let it become that, they made it that way and were okay with it. But when you say they built it, who's they? The, poli- the police, the policing. Oh, okay. Okay. The policing built it. That's when I say, but the, but is, but they want, they, they were okay with that. Right. Uh, you call it like uh, you, I'm not even trying to get to any other place other than if you have a community that you already have feelings about, which they must have because they they didn't go in there and go, hey, there's a drug problem in this area. Let's get in here before it gets bad. No, they said, let's let it go unless it comes out of this neighborhood. That's really essentially what how everything went down. They didn't right. care. When a cop got killed, that's when it changed, and that's when they wanted everybody. And that's why it went the way that it went. That's when they're, but it, it's, it's, it's eye-opening when you see, and this is where the butt is. This is the butt. It's eye-opening when you see how they look at it when it's not affecting them and what they name it and how they deal with it. And now it affects you, and now... We're gonna go in and we're gonna we're gonna do uh, tap. We're gonna get wiretaps. We're gonna get, do all the investigation. We're gonna pay to find out uh, from informants. How did it all change? So basically, as long as it's blacks being killed, we'll we'll hang out over here. Right, I, you know that, but you know. If you're supposed to be doing your job as law enforcement, protect and serve, as it says on a patrol car, all protect and serve all communities. 
And your attitude is, as long as it don't affect us, whatever goes on over there is over there. Let them kill themselves. Let them weed themselves out. That, to me, mentality-wise, is, is very animalistic let's, and, and very and, fucked up. And let, So I just always find it funny that, that they use we, the term animal. Right. Yeah. We get labeled these things, and we get described as this. And somehow th- they, you know, throw their hands up in the air and accept no responsibility for, for what they do. Well, that certainly doesn't help the, the situation. And, and, and to add to that, yes, there was a drug problem there. But what about the moms trying to protect their kids, trying to keep their kids out of trouble? There was no help for them. So they label, they label it one way. But who's the animals if you're not going to go in and take care of the kids, if you're not going to take care of the moms? I'm not disagreeing with you. I'm agreeing with you in everything oh, no, you're no, saying. I, yeah, right. I'm just, I know sometimes people don't hear me agreeing. They think I'm saying something else. I'm giving you the, I'm giving the outside of this. And, you know, much to his credit, he's one of the first people on this doc. Uh, Eric right. a- Adams, the, the mayor of New York, who was police chief. Black dude. I saw him, right. I saw jumped. him on uh, Real Time with Bill Maher. Okay, so he jumped in and, you know, but, you know, what's funny and it's not, I, I, I don't mean funny, haha. You know, he's, he would be thought of as too conservative to a lot of people in the black community, as too aggressive, as too uh, police mentality. Right. Right. But um, he did get, he did get made mayor. So, I mean, some people were listening to him. I'm not, I, I, I don't know how he's doing right now in the polls, but, uh, yeah, he had some issues as he entered, but he he entered at one of the worst times to be mayor. Kind of going back to what you said before about, you know, when they're doing what they're doing, are they realizing how they're affecting the community versus when they're in jail? Uh, you know, you I heard Supreme and Prince talking about all this righteousness, and they would talk about five percenters and self-improvement and betterness getting out of poverty and all these things that are deemed positive uh, within, you know, within the black community and, you know, it, 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 you know, inner self and righteousness and 5% is my brother. But then I'm going, don't you dilute your message when you slang the drugs within the community and you're clearly destroying lives. Like how, how are you trying to sell one thing when you're doing a, the other? You know, the, 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 you know, this is the irony of, of it. I mean, we, we do this legally all over all the time. I mean, alcohol has been legal here for a long time. I mean, it was a point where there were during prohibition where it was illegal, but it's kind of, I, I think the way that it's looked at, it's kind of on the people. I, I, this is the product that I have. If you're willing to buy it, and uh, the reason I'm saying alcohol is that we have people that uh, drunk driving accidents, people who are addicted to alcohol, people who have beaten their children, beaten their wives, uh, wives beating their children, wives, whatever, however you want to take it, that's from alcohol. And it's like, okay, this, we deem this to be all right because we can, we can tax it and make money on it. Uh, but it's not, but it's not, necessarily healthy but it's it's manageable except for the few so we allow a certain amount of people to not be able to handle it not be able to take care of it not be able to accept it the problem with when it's happening with an illegal entity like crack was is that it was so inexpensive anybody could get into that and because it was so illegal who's stopping the young kid from doing it this is what i don't like Illegal drugs are tougher because the dealer doesn't care if it's a 15-year-old or a 13-year-old. Because they're already dealing. They're going to get in trouble either way. What's the difference? Something that is, you know, something that's mind-blowing to me, and I can't fathom this, is when one of the guys from the crew said, yeah, man, at one point we were making twenty to 30000 a day. A day. How many motherfuckers are doing drugs? Well, that you can make that not even if you told me 20, 30 K a week, I would go, damn, a day. 
How many? I, I would imagine it's like to me that almost looks like how much money do the motherfuckers who are responsible for the the, the Lincoln Tunnel? As many cars drive through there back and forth from sunup to sundown. If how much money is that in one day? I would imagine it's like that. How many motherfuckers are going through the Lincoln Tunnel of drugs to be making that kind of money? But it, it also remember you're getting you're buying a five dollar rock, right? And it only gives you about five minutes of high. Let's say it even gives you seven minutes of high, ten minutes of high. And, but it gets you so high. And remember, this is also, I know you haven't tried drugs, so I'm going to give this to you. You always chase your high. So the highest, the highest you're ever going to be is the first time you do it. And you're always going to want to be that high. The problem is you're never going to be that high again. Oh, no, listen, I, I told you, when I went on my, my binge of, you know, at one point, man, me, ecstasy, nigga, me, me and my okay. brother was, we was doing ecstasy. Like, nigga, that, that first time, again, like I said, I, that euphoria, pissing felt like I was coming for eight minutes. And the worst thing that can happen to anybody the first time that they do a drug, I'm sorry, is if everything goes right. Oof. If everything goes right, oh my God, you're fucked. You oh. want it. This is why when someone says the first time I did, I had a bad trip. Congratulations. Good for you. Because at least you have some reality of what it is that you're doing. And if you want to do it again, great. But you're always going to remember my first time wasn't great. First time, if it's great, <laughs> you are fucked, no matter what drug it is. Uh, but yeah, you only get five to seven minutes. You're always trying to get high. So how many times can you get high in a day? And how much can how much are you willing to spend per day? Can you spend so you're saying a lot of those guys are repeat customers oh, in yeah, a day? A day. What? A day. How much is it? You get five. You get five dollar, ten dollar, five or ten dollar. And most rock. of these people are, are are broke. So where's this money? Where are you get the money? That's why people are sucking dick for five dollars to get a rock. Jesus. Now listen. I need to. I need to go get start going to junkie neighborhoods. Get my dick sucked. I understand this crack game. I was never. I was never around crack. I had one moment. I got to tell you the story. It's not a great story, but I did coke. I love coke. Coke was great. I had a great experience the first time I did it. And I loved it. I'm telling you, I really did. I enjoyed doing, I enjoyed it. Uh, it got me fucked up later, but I did enjoy it. But one night we were out and some of my friends said, hey man, there's this new thing. Uh, these crack rocks, man. And he said, what we do is we put it in a joint and we break it up and we put it in a joint and then we smoke it. He goes, or you could just smoke it straight. You want, you want to try it? And I, we went out to go get it. We went to go get it. And crack from what, as I understand it, I'm telling you things from what I understand from the little bit that I know, but here it is. Uh, the first time you get it, it can, you can become addicted off your very first time. I mean, addicted, not like you want to do it again, like you're addicted. Uh, and that's my understanding of it. Anyway, Oof. I'm so happy because I already liked, I already liked Coke and Coke was expensive. Coke was $120 a gram in the eighties. Crack was $5 for a rock. So, had I tried that and had it gotten me high and had I had a good time, I don't know if I if we'd be talking, to be honest. And then when I You'd started- probably be sucking my dick. And I don't think I would get to know you. <laughs> where, you know, this is, this is where you're at, man. I don't know. I, I really don't know. I'm happy that, I'm, that we went to go find it. The dude who had it wasn't around. He couldn't find it. We didn't do it. And then I started hearing bad things about it. And I was like, no, nah, I don't want to do that. And uh, luckily, I never did. I'm telling you, man, the stories that I've heard, people that I know, I know people who were addicted to crack. I know this one girl and I would talk to her and we talked about maybe 10, 15 minutes about uh, the fact that she was she had done crack. And I asked her a bunch of questions because I'm very curious how what it did to people and how it affected people. And after she's done, she goes, I got, she stopped. She goes, I, I can't talk to you about it. And she goes, if you look at my ears right now, I can feel it. They're red, right? And then she pulled her hair back and her ears are red. She goes, yeah, I still like just even talking about it. I want to do it. Damn. And she had been clean for a while, like a, a good while. And still right there. I, most people that did it and were really addicted to it, they're never, not that you ever, ever get past an addiction, truly past it. But I, I think these people are still on the edge and they'll always be on the edge with that. It, it's a powerful drug, man. Let me tell you, to, to, and I know this won't mean anything to you because you're not a gamer, but to the gamers out there, 
dude, like I said, when I when I did ecstasy, that at that particular time I had an apartment in uh, you know, midtown LA, off the Wilshire area. And I, I had a two bedroom apartment, but I had two arcade games, quarter arcade games, uh, NBA Jam and Mortal Kombat 4. And I'm telling you, man, when me and my brother first did X, and we were already good at the game, it was Matrix type shit. I mean, Neo Matrix. We could see, we dodge bullets, nigga. We could see the hits that we threw at each other coming two days early. If you watched us play, it was like watching a fucking Jet Li uh, movie. I mean, cr- like Crouching Tiger, Hidden Dragon. The, the, the blocking, the offense, the movement, it was to perfection. We could both fight each other and go a whole round and no one get a single hit. Either because we blocked each other's moves or we evaded them. The X took us to a level where we could see the fucking game, yo. We were in it. There was never more of an awesome feeling. But don't do drugs, kids. (laughs) (laughs) Uh, And my thing has always been about the drug game. If you know what the end result is, and you said that lifestyle is addictive, and yes, money, hoes, clothes, money, hoes, clothes, all the nigga knows, um, unless you have a plan to get out, why are you doing it? Because if you know that the only two endings is death and jail, what is the allure? You want to go to jail? You want to die? Why don't these guys ever have a, I've made enough money, I'm out. Because there's, first of all, there's never enough money. But I'm, oh, I'm, I'm not trying to be a joke. There's never enough money. When, when death and jail is the end result and it constantly looms over your head, I would think the fear of either one would make me go, look, man, I got to go. Once I make a certain amount of money, I'm going to either go legit or I'm going to get the fuck out. Okay, so let me go back to Supreme. When he got out and he was back on the streets and he want, he didn't take that job working for... Uh, That's crazy. Irv because, Gotti. Because he wanted... Because he couldn't be Supreme if he was... It's it's not just... It's not... It's it's everything about it. It's the power. That's crazy. It's the respect. It's everything about it that you get with it. Now... Listen, uh, like I, I'm gonna, uh, you know, it's funny because I, I, I loved it when they said there's gangsters and then there's hustlers. Oh, that was one of my earlier notes. I was like, I didn't know there was a difference. Like you say, there's jail and there's prison. Yeah. Again, I'm not of Evans. I'm more of a Huxtable. I went, what's the difference? I'm, you know, I was barely a hustler. That's what I'm gonna say. I was barely a hustler because I had, I, I had different things. One, I knew how much money I wanted to get out of it to get out. One, that's going into it. Two, uh, I knew that I had one, you have a, a one get out of jail free card. And that that card was closing when I got in trouble. So uh, because they were changing the laws. So you didn't get necessarily get out of jail, but there was one where you didn't you didn't fuck up for the rest of your life. Um, and then you you don't do it thinking you're gonna get caught. You don't do it thinking you're gonna get caught. So when you're saying you know you're gonna get caught, no. You think that you're going to get away. I know people that got away. I know people that's that crazy. Money that you would that think got that. Away. You, you, you know, some people get to beat the system. Not everybody does, but some people do. And they can make enough. I know, I know people that I know for a fact in Arizona, growing up in Tucson, man, if 40% of all the small businesses had drug money in them, not necessarily that they went out to go get drug money, but their business was dependent on drug dealers. <sighs> Their business, uh, or they use some drug money from someone that they borrowed money from to get it to get their business open. It was all, dep- and everybody knew the guys that I used to get my Harley worked on were ex fucking uh, DEA agents. Right. Everybody know knew everybody. Everybody knew it was. It's just it, it's it's a game, man. It's 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 a game. You know, it's one thing if you if you're playing the game and you don't know the rules. But when you know the fucking rules, then it to me, it goes it, it, it goes into an arrogance and a stupidity because you're playing the game knowing the rules like that's like I, I remember I was watching again. I'm in, you know, mafia shit, a mafia documentary. And they were talking about Paul Castellano. 
And he basically said the same thing about the mob as the drug game. There's only two ways out of this. No mob guy retires without either, no mob guy retires from this life. You either go to jail or you die. And I'm just going, if you know that, and you, and you, and you honestly think you're not going to get caught or you're not going to die, that's just stupid, man. You know, you know that's a different, that's, a, that's an oath to being in that business. The nice thing about the nice thing, I can't even believe I'm saying it that way. The nice thing about being your own boss in your own drug game is that if you wanted to get out, if you had enough money, you could go. You could go. You could leave. You can go. Yes. You could leave that business. You could leave it to whoever your next behind you is and wish them the best and walk away. But at some point, if you haven't figured out how to manage that money, because just like anything else, you know, like when you're an, an actor is a great example. As long as you're acting, you got money coming in. If you didn't figure out how to make that money work for you, you need to keep acting. Right. If you didn't figure out how to make that drug money work for you, you're going to need to keep dealing drugs because you're not going to go from being supreme to the guy who's the vice president of the record label. Right. That's what happens. That's what happens to these guys. Oh, you know, um, And I, so there's a point when I'm watching this and I just go, can mobsters be flashy? Sure. But the code of mobsters has always been more to me than dudes and street shit is silence. Quiet, 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 quiet. And it, it, it reminds me of that scene uh, when I, you know, I go, Amongst all the good things that black people can be, we are so hard headed. And it's like, I know some of that comes because from we never had it growing up. So once we get it, we have to celebrate it. You know what I'm saying? We, we like, because I often go, why does Floyd Mayweather have to be so braggadocious? Why does he have to show you all his cars, all his money, all his cash? These rappers, these young rappers who used to do the, who would do the money phone, you know, the money phone, right? Yeah, yeah. The stacks of money up to the ear like they're yeah, talking on the yeah. phone. And they do the thing where they spread a, a shitload of money open like a deck of cards. And I go, everybody knows real wealth, real power is quiet. The rich, you don't see Bill Gates, Jeff Bezos, Mark Zuckerberg, or fucking Elon Musk doing money phones. That's nigga shit. And then, you know, black people will say when I make posts like that, well, look, man, that's because we never had it. So we have to, we when you get something and you come from a place of poverty and you never had it, you got to show off a little bit. But then that's why I love that, that moment in American Gangster. Because I go, at what point does intelligence take over and you say to yourself, you have to be like the Ital- Italian mafia. Move in silence. Because loud attracts attention. And attention becomes your downfall. The Nicky Barnes example in fucking American Gangster. When, when Denzel pulls, she would tell OG4 into the room and goes, what is that? That's a very, very, very nice suit. It's a clown costume. You're making too much noise. You're loud. You got on a sign that says, arrest me. What do I tell you? The loudest one in the room is the weakest one in the room. At some point, I get it. You're, you're poor. You got money. You want to flash. And I think it's black in black people's natural, it's in our innate desire with jewelry. Because we come from that. Kings, queens in Africa, we come from jewelry and medallions and diamonds. So that's part of us. But at some point, turn the volume down, yo. You're doing illegal shit. Why are you making eyes come on you? Why are you putting attention on yourself? I just wonder at what point does intelligence take over? I don't know that it... It's not the intelligence. I think everyone is intelligent enough to know that when you're doing flashy shit, People are looking at you. It's when you real. it's not the intelligence. It's when you realize that you don't need, it's become the security of yourself. It's not that I can't have it. I don't need it. There's a difference because there's a, there's a difference between being growing up, feeling you're not allowed to have it versus I can have it. There was a, there was a, there was a moment where I had some stuff. And, I, you know, I'd buy stuff. And then I realized one day, 
I don't have to get that because the day I want it, I have all the money here to go get it. So I stopped buying shit. There was a time when I just stopped buying shit because I didn't need it. Because I didn't need it that day. And I had plenty of money for the day I needed it, if I needed it, if I ever needed it. But there would be things I had. I had dumb shit. I had some dumb shit, dude. Because dumb shit is, you know, I'll be really honest. I, and I think this is uh, this goes back to man shit. I think women are better at this part of the uh, of that business, and that's why I think women who run cartels and shit like that are more dangerous. Women don't need to attract women. Men need to attract. We <laughs> we send shit out to attract women. That's why. Right, that's the right. reason we work in the first place. But right. like, like, what's my nice car for? Why do I have a? Why do I need a nice car? I mean, it's nice to have a car. It has a warranty that if something goes wrong, you get to the dealership, it's taken care of. But why do you need that nice car? What does that car say about you? Men have nice cars because they know women like nice cars. Why does a man who lives in Arizona need a boat? But I got to disagree with you on, on a little bit of this. Listen, man, there are some dudes. And I remember I saw DJ Khaled in an interview and he ba basically echoed this. There are some dudes that like nice shit. We all they like, like right. We all like nice shit. There's no problem. But like you just said, what's nice shit though? What's not what is nice shit? If we you know had, what nice shit is. Yeah, okay, but if you have a nice watch, right? If you had a nice car, right? What do you what else do you need? Now, 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 now this time you have a nice house, but do you need what kind of house do you need? What when does nice become showy? extravagant? Yeah, and showy. When does nice be like I want to show you? Because well, listen. First of all, let's say it this way: This is who I am. But now I need to show you who I am, or are you who you are? There's a point where you need to be bigger than who you are. With is that nice, ego? You saying that's ego driven? Yeah. That ego gets you. That ego is what puts people in jail. Ego is what takes you down. Listen, in regular business and non-criminal activity, I say go for it. Be as flashy as you want to be. There's nothing wrong with that. But if you're flashy. But if, in a, but if you're in a, in a business where it could all be taken from you because you're doing illegal shit, dude, I would be so scared of going to jail and getting caught. I wouldn't want to be flashy. But Unless I was out of the game. If you're flashing a regular business, everybody knows you have a regular business. Everybody knows why you have this business. You don't have to be that flashy because you have the, you already have what comes with, I have this big business. I, I own this. This is me. When you're just dealing drugs, that's who you are. So now, how do I show you that it's more meaningful than just drugs? Look at it. Your ego has to get small when you do illegal shit, but it's hard to stay small when you want people to know that I'm smart, I'm brilliant, I made all this money. How do I, how, how am I supposed to, that's the downfall of the drug game. Because you're not a CEO, like you're not getting into, there's no, there's no magazine that says top drug mover of the month. Listen, the average person would know who the who the who the big time billionaire CEO is if he's not famous? Listen, we know who Jeff Bezos, Zuckerberg, uh, you know Gates, Buffett. We know who these guys are because yeah, you see their pictures, you see them in magazines, you see them on social media. But once upon a time ago, before social media, you wouldn't know Jeff a Jeff Bezos or a, or, or a Grant Cardone walking down the street from a Joe Blow who. Is you know doing custodial work. Okay, let's take and, it up in civilian clothes. Let's take it up one more level then. And this is where everybody's lost. This is where you got to. And this, and before you make that point, this is where I would understand that frustration. If I'm a multi-billionaire CEO, Jeff Bezos type, and we all want the same thing, whether you're a fucking cashier or you're a Jeff Bezos, if you're a dude, you want pussy. Like you said, you want to impress hoes. How does she know who you are unless? You do something to show her who you are. Otherwise, she's got every reason to pass you up on the street like she does the nigga that works at McDonald's. 
All right, but let's 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 take this up one more. So we just said the drug dealer does it for that reason, and then the Bezos and and uh, the Elon Musk, all those guys, they're known, right? And then if you read uh, the richest men in uh, the richest men in the world books and all that stuff, dude, why, why? Where's the Rothschilds in there? How come you never see their name on it? How come you don't ever see their dollar amount, their wealth? We know Elon Musk is the richest man in the world with two hundred and forty billion dollars. How much does the Rothschilds have? No idea. You know why? Because they move in silence because they're the real motherfucking gangsters. But is but but I don't know who the Rothschilds are, but is there a Rothschild who's like any one of those dudes that's a single man? You know what I'm saying? I don't know. I don't know if the Rothschilds are old fucks, but is there a Rothschild that's in his 30s, 40s, single man that's that would love some pussy? Uh, yeah, but when you move in that kind of, when you move like that, it's a different, it's a different category. When you, when you have your jet pick you up, you don't need to say shit. Okay. But unless that jet is landing in the middle of Times Square and some women see you get out of it, how do they know you have a jet? Because you want a bitch that don't care. They already know that your money's there. They know because of where they move. We're we're still moving in bullshit until we get to this level where there's these people who run this world. Sometimes it feels like fame is more powerful than money. Because I guarantee you, Screech, before he died, Screech was getting some pussy. And I know he ain't got that kind. I know he didn't have that kind of paper. Fame is also like you. It's it's the uh, it's the aphrodisiac. It gets you excited because everybody knows somebody. Yeah, that's what I'm saying. Without the aphrodisiac, without the aphrodisiac, if you got that kind of money, how do they know? There's people that move in a different league that we're not in. They're not even famous. People are in. You know, certain people get there. Certain people get there, but it's not all of us, dude. That's so intriguing to me. Oh, that's so intriguing to me. There's people that you do not know their names that have more money than you could ever imagine. And they don't care. And they don't care. They don't, they're not Trump where they have to put their name on their plane. It's just another white fucking, it's, it's another white fucking 10, uh, 30, 40, 50 million, $100 million plane sitting there. You don't know what's, when you see the shell of the plane out there and there's no name on it, you don't know what happened on the inside of that plane. You don't know what uh, kind of interiors in it. You don't know anything about it. All you know is that someone walked in there and they don't even want you to know their name. The people that need to know, know their name. That's it. There's a whole different level. And as long as you we we think at this one level, that's where we're going to be. So I, I I don't know. I don't know. I don't move in that in those people. I don't move in that world. I just know that world exists. When America wants your ass, the justice system gets your ass. <laughs> that switch from when he said uh, that switch from state to federal, when he said the illegal wiretaps were allowed in simply because it went from state to federal. And I thought Prince made a great point when he said, I thought innocent was innocent. The government gets two bites at the apple. What does that mean? Oh, that's the state and the federal. Yep. They get two bites at the apple. It's that's not, it? Yeah, it's not legal, but it's... they See, they, 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 see and that's what I'm... This is what, man... See, and that's so disheartening that even in doing illegal shit, you are supposed to have rights. And even those rights can be illegally fucked with when, the, when they want your ass. So it's like I'm already doing illegal, which means I should be in jail, but I still have rights. But to violate my rights, you're going to be illegal to put me in jail for doing illegal. You know why? This is fucking insane. You know why? It takes a gangster to put a gangster in jail. Well, there it is, God damn it. There it <laughs> is, God damn it. <laughs> That's it. <laughs> right. And who's been more gangster in America? That's it. That 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 is it right there. That's that that that's the name of the podcast. It takes a gangster to be to put a gangster in jail. <sighs> uh I'm going to see if I got one more thing before we get out of here. Because I still got notes on this, but 
Yeah, yeah this was a good document. Well, well, let me say this yeah, while you're looking at the notes. It's right. a good documentary. It's three episodes. It's worth watching. It really tunes you into what was going on in New York at that time. I was there for a minute of it and got to see some of it in action. Uh, right. I, I was young and I was still in. This is where I realized why New York isn't the same. I don't have the same. I love New York. Right. I don't have that same energy that I had when I was in my 20s in New York. Like New York and my energy matched. Do you know what I mean? Mm -hmm. Now I'm here in New York. My energy is different. So I'm in a different, my, my, I'm attracted to different things that aren't as exciting as when I was here when I was younger. But that, right. that New York, man, I'm telling you, uh, that was an exciting time. It was a really rough time. Uh, but it was a very interesting time here in the city. And I'm not going to say that I would like it to go back to that, but I miss some of that grittiness that New York had. Listen, they, I, I think the Italian mafia is all but dead in New York. Well, uh, yeah, you know, uh, Little Italy is different than it was before. It's not the yeah, same. It's, listen, there's always going to be some semblance of, of, of dirt. Because that's just, you know, New York's New York. It's a major fucking city. Uh, but yeah, was it at the level that it once was? No, and thank goodness. Uh, but, you know, I, this last point, I, you know, I just was looking at this thing and I've always felt this way. And it's like, I always had this feeling, I, I never knew for sure, but I always had this feeling that Italian mobsters, real gangsters, looked at us in secrecy and kind of like laughed behind our backs, you know, and I'm. And this is going back into the real days of gangsters, the twenties and shit, or whatever. But Lucky Luciano, Al Capone, Dutch Schultz, more recently, uh, '80s John Gotti. Real mobsters killed real mobsters. They lived up to that title. And it always was funny to me when black rappers would call themselves gangsters and make songs, knowing you niggas are ultimately just reciting poetry. And I always felt like it was an insult to real gangsters, the same way it is to soldiers. When athletes compare playing a game like football to going to war, we're going to war. Real soldiers lose limbs. They have, you know, post-traumatic stress syndrome. They die. They see their comrades die in their arms. Turn the fucking volume down. This always bothered me. Like, stop it. Niggas, rappers, yo, I'm a gangster. Yo, we gangsters. You niggas are reciting poetry. Well, You're not gangsters. They did talk about that a lot in this, and a lot of the 80s gangsters that you're talking about, and rap in general, from that early set, that late 70s, early 80s, where the Godfather movie was an influence. And so that's what a lot of that is. That, that, that uh, you know, when they even said it was part of the playbook. They took from the playbook and how you were supposed right. to move. So that's part of it, you know? And so I understand what, what the relationship there is. I understand what you're saying, though, too, uh, as in uh, how it's wrong. But there's some, dude, there's some organizations that have moved very well in their gangster, in their, in their gangster business throughout all these times. And there's a lot of people that didn't go away. There's still people out there that have moved through this and made it and have survived to do well. I'm not. I'm right. not saying that's. Uh, I, I'm saying that in any in any of the businesses, that whether it was the Italians, whether it's the, whether it was uh, blacks, Latinos, whatever it is, people have always done and struggled to find their way, and you will always find a way as long as there's struggle. There's always the struggle will bring out whatever needs to elevate yourself to another level when you want out bad enough. And that's what it is. And, and it doesn't make a difference what the loss is because you don't want to stay where you are. Well, there it is. Uh, folks, you got to check it out. It's called Supreme Team. It's on Showtime right now. Three-part documentary series. Uh, very fucking good. And again, July 29th coming up. New York City Point Gods. Uh, I'm very excited about that. Can't wait to see that. Uh, somebody, I think it was Shamor, uh, recommended the show on HBO, which is a series. I want to say where we live. I know I'm fucking this up. Uh, about the, the Baltimore police. 
My man is in that. I forget his name. He's got a new series coming out on Showtime called American Gigolo. And he was also in uh, Wolf of Wall Street, the, the, the dark haired guy that got busted behind Uh-oh. fighting with Jonah Hill uh, and I went to jail. Yeah. yeah, I forget his, his real name. Berthanol something. Bethanol, Berthanol. Uh, great actor. Uh, but goddamn it, I know people are screaming it right now. On HBO, it's a series about Baltimore police. It's gritty. I think I, I started to watch the first episode uh, a couple nights ago and just was fell asleep because I was tired. But I'm going to check that out too. Fucking awesome. Seems like it's awesome. And again, season three, final season, City on a Hill. Everything comes out July 29th. I, uh, are you looking forward to that season on the Hill? I am because I, I, they, they, they did a little bit of a marathon yesterday and this Saturday, coming Saturday, they're doing a marathon leading up to from episode one, all, or both seasons leading up to uh, season three. First season was fire. The second season I thought was a little weak. Yeah. So I'm hoping this third season is the payoff, and especially since it's the final one. Uh. Yeah, I got a show that you might want. I don't know if you'll like it as much as I do because it has to do with the restaurant business. Uh, it's on uh, Hulu, it looks like. Uh, the Bear. I watched the whole season already. It's eight episodes. Really? Yeah. Uh, it's, it's good? It's really good, but it, it has to do uh, with the restaurant. So you have to kind of, I think you need to have like a little passion for restaurant and food. Uh, maybe, maybe not. Well, nigga, lo- my body was built by passion for food. <laughs> There's just a lot that you, if you know, if you know a lot about it, it really makes a lot of sense, and it was great. But it's the dude. Uh, I think is it Jeremy Allen White? Is that the is that the star? That's I, th- I think that's the the lead character. Yeah, Jeremy Allen White. He was he was Lip in uh, Shameless, and I think he's I never great, really watched that show. I think he's a great actor. I really do. I'm gonna I'm I'm gonna be more interested in what he's doing now because I think we own really the good. city. Uh, HBO. We own the city. Oh yeah, yeah, yeah. That's that is that, that's, that's what it is. Yeah, that, I remember that name now. Yeah, that's going to be good. That's I haven't seen it. When is yeah. the uh, when's the um, the point gods? When does that come out? July 29th. It is the 29th, right? Yeah, okay. July 29th is point gods and city on a hill. So we're gonna yeah we we New York City point gods. They're the fucking New York City point gods. It's so we are we gonna watch it in Charlotte and then do it on that Sunday, or are we gonna do it the following week? Oh, good question. Um, we'll figure it out. Are you nervous? Because we're going to Charlotte, which is the club. Oh, yeah. Craig we didn't Robinson, even talk about that. Yeah. Where the, some motherfuckers, ka, 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 some shots went off. Well, they he ran into the building. He wasn't trying to go into the comedy club. But I thought the shots went off in the comedy club. He shot up the comedy club when he got inside. He was outside. They chased him into the club. That's so what I understood. Who the fuck was he shooting at? I don't know. He was outside with the gun and then they got chased. And he was inside the club. And I guess Craig Robinson was in the green room. He never even went out and I, I don't blame him. It's not like I would go out there and right. uh, they started shooting it up and everybody left. Well, I would imagine after that, this has got to be the safest place to perform. I would hope so. Because it's not, it's not like just in the middle of everything either. You I mean, you have to, right. you have to work your way to get in there. You I mean, it's right. It's, so hopefully, uh, yeah, they got that, uh, <laughs> I want to see someone with a wand. It's wanding people on the way in. You yeah, know what I'm talking I, about? The, the metal yeah. detector? No, nah, I just, you know, I would imagine, again, this just took place. So they they, they kind of have to be on caution. Uh, so they probably are overly protective, which, you know, I ain't mad at that. No, I'm, 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 I'm for it. Yeah. I'm for it. I, I used to have, a, I used to throw, uh, my, my friend Tim and I used to throw this hip hop night. And um, yeah, I think uh, we were wanting people at one point, and then uh, there was a there was a night that yeah that uh, kind of closed this all down actually. So uh, yeah, you have to be protective. You have to make sure that you're taking care of some shit. Right. Told me to cut you off, man, but we have to take a break. It's nothing personal. It's just business. All right. Want to give out some dates? Yeah, man. Uh, so we're going to be, uh, well, you're listening to this on Wednesday. Uh, that weekend, let's see, the Thursday, the 28th through the 30th, we're going to be at Comedy Zone in Charlotte, North Carolina. And after that, you're going to be at, oh, wow, I went too far. August, we're going to be 
at um, Mike Drop Comedy in San Diego. I will be there on the 4th doing my own show by my little lonesome. And then Aries is coming in the 5th through the 7th. And that's Mike Drop Comedy in San Diego. Uh, our first time out there. Very excited to be in San Diego. Uh, week after that, the 11th through the 14th of August, we'll be at the Chicago Improv. And then the 18th through the Stephanie 20th. Stephanie hit me up. Stephanie hit me up, the manager from Schomburg, and was yeah. asked, Aries, are you bringing your own opener? I said, yeah, of course. Uh, uh, fucking Andy. Um I'm going, in my mind, I was like, we were fucking just there. Didn't it feel like we were just there? No, nah, we were there. It was, it's been, a, it's been a minute. Really? Yeah. Yeah. It, right. Yeah. It, it, this, it, it just all, this whole two years just seems like one giant, you know, just it, because we, it, it just wasn't normal. Uh, <laughs> well, I'm looking forward to uh, a scroller. Yeah. Yeah, that that was. Think about it. That was a. It had to be a year ago, didn't it? Yeah, I guess so. The uh, 18th through the 20th will be in uh, again in August. We'll be at the Stress Factory in Bridgeport, Connecticut, and then we got a week off, and then we're back at Cap City Comedy Club in Austin, Texas. Very excited to do that. That's our first time there at Cap City. It's the reopening of Cap City, so we're excited to be out there. And then followed up by Addison Improv in Dallas. Uh, the and this is all September September first through the fourth at Cap City and then eighth through the eleventh at Addison Improv in Dallas. That's it for right now. All right, uh, this is from Jordan Carter. Um, let's see, Snapchat, uh, SoundCloud at J underscore M O N the number three Y Y. Um, the name of the song is called I'm a ride by at J underscore M O N E Y Y featuring at S A U C E Y B E D A N A M E, which is his brother saucy B. I can't even fuck try to pronounce that shit, but it's J money and his brother. And this song is called I'm a ride. Enjoy. Spears and Steinberg. Thanks for listening to the Spears and Steinberg podcast. If you'd like to know who's responsible for this shit, it was hosted by Ari Spears and Andy Steinberg, produced by Steve Merrick and Anthony Holmes, executive producer, Big Papa, Robert Kelly, and Matt Klein Schmidt for the Laugh Button Podcast. For more information on where to find us on the internet, visit SpearsbergPod.com.